Okay, good morning. Uh, my name is Gary Matsuoka, and this is Laguna Hills Nursery, and today's class is on uh, the brambleberries, blackberries, raspberries, boysenberries, plus we'll make notes on the hops and kiwis also. So I was hoping that the berries would be here this week. Uh, usually they come by the first week of December, but the grower told me, well, it's uh, the week after Thanksgiving, <laughs> two weeks after Thanksgiving, so this year... Thanksgiving was a little bit late, so they're coming in this coming week. But I'll, I'll show you what I have in stock right now. So um, now blackberries and raspberries, back in the 80s, we didn't worry about chill on them. But here nowadays, we know that uh, some of them haven't produced well in the last five years because of warm winters. Now, the winters this year were back to seemingly back to normal weather, and last year was pretty normal too. So we think that we'll get enough chill for all the blackberries and raspberries again, but there is a chill requirement. Um, I don't know, is everyone here familiar with what the chill actually represents? Okay, so we think we'll have enough um, chill again. Now we have a listing here of plants that are coming in. I'll pass this around. But we do have quite a number of things uh, in stock, a few from last year, in fact. But uh, blackberries, we can start with that. That is certainly a real common plant across the United States. There are two modes of, now, I will do raspberries simultaneously. Raspberries and blackberries are very closely related. And a lot of them are actually hybrids between the two. So there's hardly any true pure blackberries out there. Most of them have a little bit of raspberry in them. Uh, and the raspberries is the same way. Most raspberries have a little bit of blackberry in them. Now there's, the main style of growth is called the floricane production. That's what most of them, or all of them do, well, most of them do what is called floricane. So floricane, if you have a plant in the ground, maybe I better go back one step. The main difference between blackberry and raspberry is the fact that blackberries, the fruit, which is a collection of little berries, generally has the seeds within the fruit. And on a raspberry, and raspberries can be the same color as blackberries, the seeds are stuck to the middle, to the stem portion, and the berries, which are seedless, are surrounding that. So when you pull a raspberry part and you eat the raspberry, you get no seeds. Blackberries, when you eat the berries, you do have the seeds to contend with. They're just get stuck in your teeth and things like that. So there are black raspberries and there are different colored blackberries too. So. But that's the defining is that the uh, seeds on the raspberry don't come with the berries when you're eating them. Now fluorocaine production is a normal mode of action. So spring, summer, the plants make these new canes. Now when the plants are young, you know, they kind of look like this. This is blackberry, this is raspberry, they're rather small, not very intimidating. When they get older, I'm going to put my gloves on because I just got stuck this morning pretty good. When the plants are mature, they can make stems that look like that. So pretty thick canes coming out of the ground, pretty good size. Uh, most of them are actually fairly stiff. There's not as many running type, we don't sell as many running type of these as we do upright ones that can support themselves. But you can see the size of the stems on this plant and the size of the leaves on this blackberry. Uh, pretty massive. So generally they come up spring and summer, grow full length, which can be for raspberries, four to six feet. For blackberries, it can be all the way up to 15 foot long. 
and they just grow. First year they just grow. If you leave them natural, they'll grow with unbranched. They'll just essentially, like this stem, they'll just grow a real long stem, unbranched. We cut that tip off so it branched out, but generally they'll grow one real long like this the first year. And then in the winter they drop their leaves. And the next spring what they'll do <clears throat> is they'll side branch off the stem that was there during the winter and then make flowers and fruit and clusters on the ends of these. So that's your spring. They start growing, blooming, and by summer the berries are ripe. And then the stem dies. So the stem lives about a year, year and a few months. It grows the first year, branches out, flowers, fruits the second spring and summer, and then it's dead. By fall it's totally dead. And at the same time what the plant does then is it starts making a new crop of stems. Sometimes they come off the base of the old one, sometimes out of the dirt, out of the roots. And then the following year, these will branch and bloom. So that's normal floricane production. Now, if you live in Minnesota or Canada, floricanes don't work too well for you. Because what happens, it's so cold that all these stems freeze in the winter and you get nothing. So um, for the northern areas, they found some that called primo cane. Of both raspberries and blackberries. And what they do is they'll start new stems in the spring and summer. And usually starting around August, September, they'll start to bloom. They'll start to flower off the tips of these as they grow. And all the way into late fall, they'll be flowering and fruiting on that, on that year's growth. So they call this primo came first year flowering and fruiting. So up in Minnesota, Canada, where these these can freeze all the way to the dirt every winter, but every spring you get new stems that come up and still flower and fruit. Now around here, since they don't freeze down in the dirt, and they bloom mainly on the ends, the last six or feet or so are fruiting, you can, in the winter, just cut this off, and the next spring, the bottom part of this branch will then flower and fruit also. And they call that then the ever-bearing types where they have a crop summer, fall, and a crop spring, summer off the same branch. So the prima canes do have an advantage in that around here they can fruit pretty much year round. Most of them though have their best season. So some of the berries do their best, make their best berries in, in summer, fall. And some of them definitely make their best berries in the spring, spring, summer season. So that's primo cane, floricane. Uh, a lot of these things can do, uh, you know, do the double, uh, they call them ever bearing. Is that a thing we have here, floricane? No, there, there's, there's, we have both types. Yeah. Okay, so we'll start with the blackberries. I mean, generally, the most famous blackberry in Orange County definitely is boysenberry. Boysenberry is um, a hybrid, so it's got some raspberry in it, too. It, it definitely is a floricane. So it just has a spring-summer crop. 
but as far as flavor, size, it's really hard to beat boysenberry. The story of it's kind of unique. So it was developed either in Northern California or Oregon, did lousy up there. Doesn't take the rain too well. So the guy who started, uh, um, Mr. Boysen, um, he had kind of abandoned his farm, says this isn't working. But when Walter Knott wanted to start a berry farm in Orange County, one of the ag people remembered that there's this big giant berry up north that wasn't doing too well up north. So they went to his abandoned farm and found a few living plants, brought them down to Orange County, and our drier climate, wonderful berry. And that became the Knott's Berries Farm with the boys and berries. Uh, I've read recently there's only one farm left that grows boys and berries. The problem with boys and berries, they don't ship well. When you pick them, they're breaking up. They're, their skin is so tender that they're just busting up in your hands. So you got to eat them right away, which, you know, um, or make pies out of them right away, or preserves right away. So there's only one farm left, and, they, and it, I would imagine it serves Knott's Berry's farm uh, to make their pies and things. But one, maybe two farms left that still grow boys and birds. But it's a great homeowner berry. It's still you know, hard, hard to beat flavor-wise. Um, Another one that's been around a long time in Orange County is a lolly, also floricane, uh, also really big berries. Um, they might ship a little better than a boysenberry. And not, they may be marginally not as good, but they're, they're good. Olalis and the boysens are, are two of our favorites. Now, the University of Arkansas has been doing a lot of work. Um, the problem they have back there, so the blackberries and raspberries in general love the West Coast. They like the cool springs that we have. Uh, although this year was kind of almost too cool a spring, you know, we couldn't get anything started. But the berries love that. They love Oregon, they love Washington because of that too. The springs are cool. And the berries do best when they ripen during cool weather. Now, Arkansas is a different climate. So they're the Midwest climate. It's, you know, 90 degrees by May. Uh, and the berries haven't done well there. So they have, you know, they can't use these at all back in there. So they've been developing berries that handle the heat better. Um, so they made one a few years ago, I think it was 10 years ago, called Primark which stands for Primo Cane, but Primark 45, which, you know, in Arkansas, most berries turn out real small because of the heat. Well, Primark 45 turned out pretty nice in Arkansas, brought to California, got huge. Uh, because of our climate here is cooler in the summer, spring and early summer, the berries are even better here than they did in, in Arkansas. But uh, we like this one. Its main crop is, so it's the primo cane. The main crop is August through November. This is Primark 45 here. It is kind of nasty thorny. Um, and it's done real well. It doesn't need, you know, dur during the real warm winters we had, this thing still produced well. We think the primo canes really don't need a winter since they produce on new growth in the spring and summer. So uh, it's done quite well. Um, a friend of mine who's grown it for ever since it's come out says the spring crop's not that good. So what he does with his and what they would do, say, in Minnesota is you just cut these to the dirt every winter, let them regrow, and you get a crop every summer and fall. When the other berry, when the other blackberries aren't producing anymore, so it's kind of a neat crop that way. Um, so pretty good size, you know. I would say compared to these two, it's medium-sized berries, but a real long season on it. Wickedly thorny. That's the only thing bad about it. Um, now this is self-supporting. Olali is self-supporting. Boysenberry is real viney. You'll need to support that one. Now there is a seedless boysenberry, 
Um, the berries are a little smaller. Production on thorny ones a little better. Um, I'm not sure what we're getting from our supplier this year. Last year they said we're getting the seedy ones and they sent us a seedless one. So we, we're not sure if they know what they're selling us either. Uh, hopefully they're tagged properly. Um, but boysenberry is very vine-like. You'll probably want to support it, although you don't have to. It just becomes a mass on the ground if you don't. Whereas these are fairly upright plants. The stems arch out. They'll grow about 10, 10 foot long or so and make berries all along the ends. Now one of the newer training methods of blackberries so they don't get so big, so people grow them in the, a lot of growers grow them in Quonset hut type greenhouses and they can't, they don't have the room for them. So what a lot of them do is they let them grow about three feet, pinch them, and then you get two branches, let them grow about two or three foot, pinch them again, you get more branches, uh, and they'll be shorter. I haven't really experimented too much with that method to see how well it works. So we have Primark 45. Now we're getting in, we have a lot of Primark 45s right now. We are getting in Prime Freedom. Also from University of Arkansas. I don't know how close he was really to Primark, but it is also Primo Cane um, and it is thornless. We haven't grown this one yet. We, you know, when we get them in, they sell out immediately. We're going, okay, <laughs> we got to save one this year to see how well, because the Primark's done real well for us. Prime Freedom, I don't know if the chill factor on it's higher, because there's some blackberries that won't produce here. They need more cold in the winter. I'm assuming Prime Freedom does, because we haven't had any complaints at all. People have been growing this now for about a year. But uh, don't know as much about it as the Primark 45 we've grown for many years now. And then Kiowa. Kiowa is also from University of Arkansas. This one has done well here. So we've grown this for about three or four years now. Um, it is a floricane. The main reason you get Kiowa is because the berries can reach three inches in size. So they get some big berries on them. And that's what this branch was. This is a Kiowa blackberry branch, so you can see the size of it. So this uh, a stem this thick can probably make really big berries this coming year. Now there's a new one we're getting, and we have no idea how it's going to do. called snowbank. As far as I know, it's floricane. It's probably not very big, and it's white. And it was developed by Luther Burbank uh, over 100 years ago. They, just, they said they just found, they thought this was, had disappeared totally a long time ago, and someone found a supply of it that was still available, so they resurrected snowbank. Uh, the whitest blackberry they know of. So there are a number of ice, uh, white blackberries. The first one of the first ones is called Iceberg, but they've had quite a few. They said Snowbank is kind of like the whitest of the blackberries. I have no idea if it does well here. The zones on it are five, listed at five through nine. We're actually zone ten according to that categorization of winters. So we might be not cold enough for it. Luther Burbank developed things in Northern California. So it's possible this won't work, but we're trying it just to see. So I said it's a great presentation with berries for 4th of July. <laughs> okay, I think that's all the blackberries we have. Uh, 
Uh, Marion berries related to boysenberry should do well here. I haven't I haven't really grown that one. Uh, and then uh, there's quite a few. I mean, we carry Marion berries now and then. I might even have a few right now. Um, we've we've done triple crown. Triple crown is supposed to be a wonderful blackberry. So I'll put that down. Triple crown. Um, for I know it's a floricane also, but that one needs a chill. And for five years, it wouldn't do anything. Um, but this year, some of our customers raved about it. And even last year, some of our customers raved about it. But we quit carrying it because for four years, we couldn't get it to do a thing. Couldn't get it to bloom, couldn't get it to do anything. So we kind of gave up on it. But it's supposed to have big berries, supposed to be thornless. Supposed to make a big crop. It's supposed to have no faults. It's supposed to also be resistant to disease. So um, the, most of the diseases that blackberries get are associated with wet weather, since most of them are grown in Oregon and Washington commercially. And again, boys and bear and lolly. Well, but lollies we quit carrying for 10 years because we, whenever we had them, they got the rust on the leaves, the orange rust or yellow rust. They said was fatal to these plants. But we had so much feedback from customers that says, no, they do fine. Apparently, in our drier climate, the rust doesn't mess them up that much. But if you take that plant up into Oregon, it's just going to mess it up totally. The, the disease, the amount of rust they get on their leaves, this messes them up. But here, even with the rust on them, because uh, you know, we couldn't, every time we got a lolly in, in the 1990s, it would, the leaves would get this rust going on. Because we, we, so we told ourselves, we can't sell this. We can't sell a sick plant. But uh, our customers told us otherwise. Go ahead. Doesn't seem to affect their production here. But uh, Triple Crown is supposed to be a real, real sturdy plant. I don't know. We might try it again. Our winters seem to be getting colder again. Back to normal. So. There's other blackberries out there too, but uh, these again, these are the main ones that we'll be carrying. Okay, the raspberries. And most of them are red, so if we don't say anything, it's a red raspberry. Um, the famous one that's somewhat hard to get is Baba. So Baba was discovered in Idlewild, just grown by a riverbank by Gertrude Milliken back in the 19, gosh, when was it? 1950s. Uh, and she loved the fruit. Uh, her grandkids loved it. They liked their grandmother. They called their grandmother Baba. So it got that nickname, Baba Raspberry. Now, something's weird about this because it totally changed its character I mean, we carried it in the 80s, and I grew it, and what we noted, you know, it's a floricane, and it's the biggest raspberry I've ever grown, biggest fruit size. Well, nowadays they list it as a primo cane. The ones we're getting from our grower do fruit in the fall. When I grew it back in the 80s, it never fruited in the fall. I don't know if it's the same plant or if the plants evolved or a sport off it is evolved and became a primo cane. Or maybe because our fall, our falls are warmer that it fruits in the fall too. I don't know. But I never could get that thing back in the 80s to fruit in the fall. And they seem to be smaller berries now. So don't know what's gone on with the baba in the last 30, 35 years. One we've kind of grown to like is Rosanna. Now we don't get this from Dave Wilson. Um, this is a primo cane. We got it from um, one of the California root fruit growers. Um, um, ah, can't remember her name now. She died recently. I should remember her name. But Rosanna originated in Italy, or Sicily, 
um, and was brought to the Midwest or Minnesota area because it's a primo cane so they can actually grow raspberries there. The stems freeze to the dirt every year and then they grow back in fruit. And we brought it here and it's done really well for us. It'll grow you know, a foot or so and then start fruiting right away. So we do like that aspect of it. Um, they're kind of small to medium. I'll put down medium size. But because they fruit an awful lot, uh, we do like that one a lot, the Rosanna. There are a lot that we don't know much about. Now we have one called Canby, which is a Floricane, also medium size. And that's this one here. We get them in um, because, mainly because the stems are, near, are fairly thornless where they're making fruit. They have some thorns at the base of the stems, and on raspberries the thorns are like brushes. They're not as they're not hooked or curved like they're on blackberries, which are real nasty. They're more or less a, a brushy uh, thorn. But can be is very thornless for the berries form. So we do call it thornless, since you'll probably not encounter any thorns. I would say the quality is not quite as good as the top two. But uh, certainly the thornlessness is, is a good feature for it. And it has done well in the past, but truthful, I haven't grown it since the 90s. In our warmer winters, uh, a few years ago, might have affected it. And the rest of these, we don't know a whole lot about still. So Anne, this will be the second year for Anne. Um, it's yellow. And you know, I... Don't remember if it's a primo cane or a floricane. Let me see if it's in the catalog. It says it's the largest of the yellow raspberries. That's summer in the fall, so it must be a primo cane. A lot of the yellow ones are, are primo cane. It says quarter size fruit. Low chill, zones 3 to 10. So it should do well here. We haven't really grown it yet. Whenever we order it, we only get a few. Then the jewel, which is a black, it's a black raspberry, but you know it's a raspberry because the seeds don't come with the with the berries when you eat them. And it says large. This one said large also. And it sounds like a floricane, May through June harvest. Now black raspberries are supposed to be more disease prone than the other varieties, although I don't know if we have many raspberry diseases around here since it's not a, it's not a wild plant in the area. We've tried quite a few other raspberries and a lot of them went fruit. I don't know, we'd get flowers on them and no berries forming, so we didn't know what was going on there. Like Heritage Willamette. We, we try several different kinds of raspberries and never got much production on them, so we don't know what's going on. So these two are, are our main, main raspberries to grow. I mean, we're sad. The best raspberry we grew was one back in the 80s called, uh, what had many names, San Diego. So if you ever see any of these around, you know, if you find any of these, uh, San Diego, uh, Oregon. the original name of it was Oregon 1030, total failure in Oregon, they brought to San Diego and it did well. Um, 
It's also known as California something. But anyway, Oregon 1030 really, I mean, it wasn't, the fruit wasn't as big as the baba berry, but it was solid. It was like twice as heavy. We love the flavor of the Oregon 1030, but we've heard it disappeared. Uh, what happens a lot of times to fruit varieties is they pick up some kind of virus and the whole line gets infected with the virus and uh, makes them so they just stop production, so they just have to get a new variety. Okay, so some of the other pests on blackberries and raspberries and boysenberries, um, there's a few. I mean, bug-wise, the one that's, that kind of messes up your head, I'm not sure what it is. It could be a thrip, it could be some other critter, but right in the berries themselves, so you have this cluster of berries, and generally if you... If when you harvest, you poke through them, you see little bugs crawling in there. You go, I don't want to eat this. How do you wash them out of there? So now, since we have a couple of better, uh, you know, what I, and back in the 80s, we didn't have these sprays. So all you did is you closed your eyes and ate them. You didn't look at them too closely. But now that we have Captain Jack's Dead Bug Brew, which is real good killing thrips and chewing bugs, and we have the oil sprays, and both these are organic, the oil sprays that control sucking bugs really well. If you just spray them a few times in, in the spring with these, uh, you should be able to clean out your berries really well so there's nothing crawling around in there. But that's the one thing that would stop me from eating a lot of raspberries back in the 80s. I couldn't seem to get the little critters out of the, the berry clusters. It was, you know, it, was, it would be better for us to make smoothies out of them so we couldn't tell. <laughs> but, uh, well, it's got a chemical in it called spinosad, which is found in rum. And there's a lot of products with spinosad in them. Uh, Cam Jacks is one brand. Uh, Monterey has one called uh, Garden Insect Control. But there's several, several brands of, of spinosad. But, um, you know, it's, it's one of the best insecticides we've ever had since you can spray it. It'll control chewing bugs and, and thrips. And you can spray it on herb or lettuce and eat it the next day. We never had a product that you can eat the next day that would control chewing insects. And they consider, you know, they, it's considered just about non-toxic since we drink rum. So it's, and then the oil sprays, uh, cover bugs up, they can't breathe for half an hour when they're covered with oil, they suffocate and die, and the oil evaporates and it's gone. So they consider these quite organic. We have, uh, this is a mineral oil, so made from petroleum. We have the neem seed oil, which is made from plant oils, and then a whole new class of them, and I didn't bring them up here, um, Dr. Earth has, de has developed ones that have, and there's a lot of similar ones on the market now. They, the industry just exploded this last year and everybody's come up with their own recipe of rosemary oil, canola oil, um, um, uh, cinnamon oils, garlic oils. You know, they just mix a whole bunch of different oils together, uh, essential oils, which are, in, you know, these plants like herbs make oils to repel bugs. That's the main purpose of these oils, is to repel things from eating them. So they, when they mix together five or six of them like that, and you spray that on a plant, boy, it, it's got good protection. The industry's really looking at it because they're all food-grade material, so there's no uh, environmental protection agency numbers on them. The EPA does not have to look at them because they're essentially sold and, you know, already as food. So, so those are some good pesticides to use on anything nowadays. Well, this one primarily does chewing bugs and uh, thrips, and then this one does sucking bugs. Is another bug that can be a real nasty problem are spider mites. 
which are sucking bugs. I mean, they're called sucking bugs, even though they, well, they suck. Um, and I will just covers them up and kills them. Well, still, the most effective way to kill a spider mite, even with all the chemicals out there, they said uh, the oil's still as good as anything you can get. It costs more than some of the other chemicals for use because you have to use so much of it, but for homeowners, it's our, our best thing for them. things like spider mites, mealy bugs, uh, white fly, those three. Or, uh, as far as or killing them organically, and again, the docked earth product, the neem seed oil, are the more plant oil type ones. So raspberries generally we treat the same way as blackberries. Most raspberries grow four to six feet stems. They're, they're shorter, uh, generally don't need much support. I'm sure there's some raspberries that do. When raspberries are young, they're kind of uh, weak limbed and they fall out to the side, but as they get more established, they get just like the blackberries, most blackberries, pretty stiff upright canes. Now they do, both blackberries and raspberries do root out of the stems, or uh, they, they stem, make stems out of the roots. So they do travel. Uh, what we notice is the thorny ones travel faster than the thornless ones. Um, a lot of times our customers will choose to grow them in large containers so they don't run through their garden now if you have a big yard, it's not a big deal. I had a friend who had patches of blackberries and raspberries in his backyard, but he didn't have any bushes around, and the trees were, he had fruit trees that were maybe 10 feet away, and then blackberries and raspberry, a group of them, uh, in the ground or, uh, nearby, and they would move every year. They would keep making shoots that come up two or three feet uh, from the main, the center of this mass, and if he didn't want them, he'd just pull them out. If you have bushes in the area, then it becomes a pain, because they'll grow right through the bushes, and you can't get them out of there because the bush is in the way, but if you have bare dirt, big slope, or just trees around, then it's easy to control them as they travel. And again, uh, the thorny ones travel faster than the thornless ones. In a pot, one time I put a thorny one and a thornless one in the same pot. The thornless one doesn't have a chance when it's next to a thorny one. Thorny one just, just kills it. Just after a year, I couldn't find any thornless stems anymore. The thorny one just, just uh, took over the pot. If you grow them in containers, we use our acid mix potting soil. Both our potting soils will work. Our acid mix retains moisture a little better. So, and most of these berries come from acidic soil climates. So we go with the acid mix, keep it wet. They like good drainage. Uh, in the ground, you know, if it's a swamp area, they won't do as well. If it's real sandy, they do fine as long as you water them. Sunlight-wise, both blackberries, boysenberries, raspberries, you gotta have at least, you gotta have more than half a day. If you have only, I tried growing raspberries once in half a day of sun. Lost the sun around 11 or 12 in the day. They would never sweeten up. They don't have any hang time. You know, if it's a grape, you can grow grapes in almost total shade because the grape will hang there and hang there and hang there and it'll stay firm for a month past the ripe date or even three or four months past the ripe date. So they have time to get the sweetness and, and get sweet. But blackberries and raspberries don't have a very good hang time at all. Uh, one, two days, they're picked or else they just fall apart, you get real soft. So if it's not sunny enough, you don't have enough sunlight there, they never get sweet. Now fortunately they do ripen, well the floor cane ones ripen mid-year. So with those, if you have sun between May and July or August, you're fine. So, uh, you know, you, if you're all about 10 feet off the north wall of a house, you're probably still good just because the sun hits that area during those months of the year. So, but very important to have sun on them. And the, and the primo canes ripening in the fall, you really have to watch your, your sunlight on those. And since they live near riverbeds, ample water, make sure the soil is moist a foot deep. 
Fertilizer-wise, um, they need something. Usually we just use the fur, uh, fruit tree fertilizer. So like Dr. Fruit Tree or Down to Earth are the two brands we happen to carry. The neem seed meal, which has a high first number, which is similar to the citrus one, is fine too. I don't know, they don't need much help. The berries, the primary thing is water, sunlight. Uh, I didn't, I've never fed my, the ones in the ground very much because they seem to just grow. If you do proper garden maintenance, like putting a mulch, an organic mulch on top of the ground, that's probably good enough in the long run. Just keep mulch well and then that's enough fertilizer for them. To start them off, I would say use a more concentrated fertilizer, but once you get going, if you just throw mulch or dead leaves on top of the ground where they're, where they're at, they'll be fine. I don't know, I don't think they're affected as much as some plants by root competition. Since my friend of mine had his growing between fruit trees, that's a lot of root competition. They don't seem to be affected as much. Uh, I would say if you have eucalyptus trees around, you probably have problems. <laughs> they suck up too much water, but uh, uh, they're not as sensitive as some plants. I mean, some plants, to put them near tr established trees, they don't do anything. So. What kind of watering do they like? like drip, flooded, overhead? They're not picky. Yeah. We've done them many ways. <laughs> Main thing is keep moist since they're riverbed plants. Um, and the only way you can check that if you have a, a stick or a piece of rebar about this thick, if you can push in the ground where they're growing at least a foot, foot and a half deep by hand, it's wet enough. If you can't push in that far, it's too dry. I think that's all on the raspberries. Right. The other ones we just cut off where the berries were. Yeah, the stems that have bran side branching are easy to see. The stems without the side branching you keep, and the stems with side branching, and they're dead anyway, so they're easy to spot. And you can do that in the fall. So in the fall, say October, when there's still green leaves on the plant, you can see the dead branches, cut them off, and That's then. The first season, second season, they branch. Right. Second season, they all branch out. And all these primo canes, like the Rosani, have the option of keeping the stem around even after it's branched out. And they branch on the tips the first year, and then they branch at the base the second year. Okay, so hops for beer lovers. If you're making beer, you need hops. It's interesting, hops are related to cannabis. So it's interesting that they used them for uh, flavoring beer. How are they related? Uh, I don't know. The, the book does mention they are related to cannabis. So Now in Europe, and I think they evolved in Europe because the Germans had them a long time ago, um, the claim is that they do their best um, around the same latitude as Germany, which is Oregon, Washington. But I had an employee who loved to make beer back in the 90s, and he grew these in our nursery in the hottest place in the nursery on our asphalt hill. And he got wonderful crops. We're going, okay, what's going on here? Um, and we just saw a research report from Florida saying that hops don't need winter chill because they were growing them as a greenhouse crop in greenhouses in Florida, and they're getting good production. They said, okay, apparently hops do not require winter. They don't need to be in Germany or Oregon. You can grow them here. The interesting thing about hops, and this is Cascade, which is one of the best varieties, and that's the one we're getting in a, in, within the week, is that there's nothing above ground in the wintertime. They die to the dirt. Very impressive growers. 
Um, even the first year, you'll get a plant that's 10 or 12 foot long full of hops. Second, third year, you get 15, 20 foot of growth, you know, starting from nothing. And we have ours in a pot that's perhaps uh, this size. I'm sure it's rooted in through the bottom, though. And, you know, there's nothing there in April. And suddenly you look at it in June, and it's 12 foot long, and it's full of hops. <laughs> it's just an incredible grower. When we get warmth in the spring, they just take off. It's a little, it's got a little bit of texture to the stem that if it wraps around something it'll hold, but it doesn't, doesn't seem to do much, it twines a little bit, it's a very light twiner, no tendrils, so you'll have to tie it up to something to get it started, but uh, they're real, it's almost like sandpaper on here, so they're, they, I think once they start wrapping around things they'll cling pretty well. And we'll get two crops or more of these, the first crop around July, cut them off, regrows, another crop, you know, and this is, I don't know if this is the third crop or the second crop on there right now. I haven't done anything with them, but we give a lot of branches away to our customers who do. Now there's a lot of different hops out there. I don't know the difference. I'm not a hop expert. Um, I've just been told Cascade is one of the best all-around hops but there are certainly some that give you a different flavor. But, and we can order uh, some different types through the year. So kiwis, um, now 30 years ago there were kiwi farms in San Diego County. As far as I know there are not any more kiwi farms. So apparently kiwis aren't reliable in Southern California, um, even though they've got the reputation as being, you know, from New Zealand, they're actually from China. And they do apparently eat some kind of chill, Although I don't think it's that much. I think it's around 300 hours of chill, which we got this year. Hopefully, we'll, I think we'll be easy to get it next year, too. But um, if we don't have, well, the problem with kiwis, so kiwis, which, you know, that's a name they picked up in New Zealand. And Chinese gooseberry would be the proper name for it. Um, but I don't know, we call it kiwis. You need both a male and a female. And the problem we've been having, if we don't have a good chill in the winter, they don't bloom at the same time. <laughs> so a lot of people tell us, well, the female's blooming, and then two months later, the male blooms. It's like they're not connecting. Now, as you get older and older, they get a longer and longer bloom season. Um, typical experience from our customers, first five years, nothing happened. After seven or eight years, I just gave up. And then by the 10th year, they're covered with fruit. We're going, okay. <laughs> so uh, they seem to take a long time. Uh, the growers have a lot of books written about how to grow kiwis. And they said the main problem with kiwis is they're so vigorous that the new growth covers up the older stems and they can't develop their, the fruiting spurs develop on the older stems. They get these real short branches, they get all knobby, and they start flowering and fruiting there. The new growth keeps covering that up, so they can't get any light, so they can't develop. So they said they spent a lot of time trimming off the new growth to keep the older parts of the plant exposed to the sunlight. And that's apparently been the problem with kiwis, too, is they're just so vigorous. They'll grow 30 foot in a year. And the books warn you, uh, you know, you can use the chain link fence but if you have any other support, you got to have four by four posts. They said the weight of a kiwi plant mature is tremendous. It'll, it'll break down any lesser support. So don't even think about using two by twos. 
Uh, it's got to be a 4x4 four four wood post to handle the weight or a metal post of some sort, a thick metal post. You can put it next to the cement wall. Most people grow them on their chain link fence. <laughs> yeah, if you have a cement wall, I'm sure that will hold it up. But if you, you know, so if you live on a hillside, be careful where you put it because the problem we have with hills in the area is that cold air is always flowing downhill. So don't put them at the top of a hill. That's not cold enough. But the very base of the same hill will be colder than even flat ground. So if you're at the base of a hill, that's the best place to put them. I mean, I had a, f a friend who had a nursery down in Chula Vista, right north of Mexico, but they were in a, a gully. And their kiwis did fine. In fact, it is strange that most of San Diego County is considered colder winter climate than Orange County. Something about Orange County, we get this influx of ocean air right through Orange County, whereas San Diego County doesn't get it. They don't get that ocean air because I guess the, the coastal ranges there, the hills, just block the airflow into San Diego County. So they get more interior air that's colder, and we get more ocean air here, which is warmer in the winter. So. Well, the originally they told us 45 degrees, 34 to 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Now we know you get chill up to 55 at least. You get less chill between 45 and 50. Well, you get less chill between like 48 and 55 than you do at 34 to 45, but you get, still get more. You still get some chill. Because the anomaly was, they always told people on the coast they couldn't grow apricots and peaches, and they do fine. <laughs> so there were, we knew there was something wrong with the chill model 20 years ago when everybody in Laguna Beach said, our apricots do fine here, and they wouldn't do well in, in Lake Forest. Uh, because the coast doesn't heat up in the winter, but it stays you know, right around water temperature, which is in the 50s. So we know that the 50s, you can get chill in the, in the say, mid-50s. Um, in fact, one of the professors down at Myra Costa College says, you know, the, you know, the, they've been saying chill is 34 to 45 degrees and no chill below and below. He says, no, th nothing in nature works like this. It's a curve. So they're saying that you get the most chill at around 44 degrees. You get more than an hour of chill for every hour you spent there. You get less as you go toward either end but you still get some chill up to 55. You just get less of it. And then you get negative chill when you get above 60. But anyway, kiwis need chill. The female that we usually use around here is called Vincent. And the male is Tomuri. I think Vincent, they should have gave the female a female name, but. The problem is with Tamuri. Tamuri. The males seem to be weaker. Our customers tend to lose the males easier. Even we lose them sometimes. Now, we have had trouble with the growers. So with raspberries and blackberries, even, you know, this is stuff our growers grew, and this is stuff that we grow. And you see how, you know, this soil is not very good. This soil is perfect. The soil we use is perfect. And the soil they use is not, but we don't worry too much about the raspberries and blackberries because they move, the plants move out of the dirt. They're only there for a few months and then they're moving out and growing out of it, so we don't worry that much about them. Kiwis don't move any place, and the soil in here, if it's bad, can kill the plant. Now, Dave Wilson, I think because the sales reps have seen what I'm doing over the years, they changed their soil mix last year, which we really makes us happy because they were using bark. And that was killing their kiwis off. But just last year, they switched it over to what looks like peat moss and perlite. I don't see much wood in here at all. So I think they, they learned, maybe from me, I don't know. So the kiwi didn't die <laughs> in their soil like it used to. But there's some kiwis I have out there from Monterey. Whoops, I just mentioned the company. Um, that are in straight redwood, ground up redwood. And those, now this time of year when they're 
pretty much dormant and you can just wash all that stuff off, put in the ground, they're fine. And that's what we used to have to do whenever we got the kiwis in from any grower. We'd, in the wintertime, wash off all the soil off those things, put them into better soil so they wouldn't make it. But even then, the male seems to be more delicate. We've lost males even when we did it right. Uh, book says one male for up to five females. And these are just the regular old fashioned brown kiwis. Um, a lot of stuff that you see, the golden kiwis, I doubt we'll see for another five, six years. Uh, and I don't even know if they do well here, because most kiwis have to be up north further. So the major place they grow kiwis now is the Central Valley where it's colder in the winter and hotter in the summer. I mean, if you've ever been to the Central Valley in the wintertime, it just kind of stays right around 40 degrees in the daytime all day, 40 to 50, and 35, 40 at night all winter long. Plus, it's really foggy there this time of year. So it just keeps that coolness in. Um, Keys, we get in a different female and a different male, but we, again, I, I really haven't grown them personally because I've heard from my customers and relatives how long it takes. <laughs> Interestingly, cats, if you do pruning on kiwis, cats find the foliage almost as good as uh, catnip. They'll just roll around in it. Okay, that's pretty much covered uh, what I want to cover today. If you have any questions, any other berries coming in, because we do have some new blueberries coming in. Well, that's pretty much it. And that new one new blackberry. We're getting in a few grapes. We're getting in more one gallon pomegranates and a few figs. So. On what kind of plant? Oh, uh, uh, sorry, blackberries. Well, yeah, that's how they propagate them. So, so if I use my own, right. So if you have a stem that you don't want, you pull out of the ground. Usually, you got enough root attached to it. So on that, just on that note, if you pull out a stem out of the ground, you usually have this long stem, and you got a few roots like this coming off of it, and then it's broken off the main part of the plant. Uh, if you want to propagate it, just cut that thing down to about six inches and bury it about an inch deeper than it was originally. And it won't dry up or anything, it'll be fine. That's so how we. You know what kind of blackberry it is? Well, you can move them. I, I don't know. You know, they like they like you know sandy soil like near a river. They like ample water. How long they been there? Okay, so on most plants, uh, blackberries and raspberries, for them to stay healthy, they got to keep moving. You know what happens in a pot is they can't go any place. So in this pot, they keep circling around, circling around. They make new roots, the old roots die. They make new roots, the old roots die. After 10 years, there's so much old root in there, they just don't do it. They're just unhealthy. All you have to do, though, is pull them out, throw away 90% of it, save the mice stem you have, and put fresh soil in there. It's all in the ground. Just right. It's all in the ground. All you have to do is dig out an area and put fresh dirt in there. You can dig dirt from another part of your yard that hasn't grown blackberries or raspberries before and just exchange it. Not, not add like your mix or That's fine too. Or the, the just soil mix. Right, as long as there's no dead roots of its relatives in it, it works. So sand works, our potting soil works. Shouldn't be, should not be. Yeah. Uh, usually it's just been there too long 
or root competition from other plants that causes trouble. Those are the main two things we've seen. Don't think so. And a lot of the thornless ones revert to thorny. So any thornless boysenberry out there that's been around for more than a few years seems to revert back to thorny. We don't know about the, uh, the prime freedom yet, whether or not it's going to stay thornless. Um, that one I don't know. Triple crown has stayed thornless, but it just hasn't done anything. <laughs> so, yes. Usually do. Um, everything in pots pretty much has gone yellow already. Now, soil temperatures have a lot to do with it. So the soil hasn't really cooled off that badly yet. It's starting to now. I mean, this last week it hasn't been that cold again, but if we have 40 degree nights for a couple of weeks in a row, that'll make the soil cold enough to probably put them to sleep. But uh, yeah, in pots, just that one or two weeks we had of 40 degrees at night, seem to put a lot of plants and pots to sleep, but a lot of things in the ground still look pretty good. So, so hopefully by, you know, our coldest two weeks of the year potentially are late December, and so that may put everything to sleep. The uh, national weather forecast for late December is cold, colder than average for us. So, we'll see. I mean, this was a tropical storm we're having right now, but it's supposed to get cold again. They told us it was going to be a warm, dry winter. It's not turning out to be either, so uh, uh, I think they're just off. <laughs> All right. Thank you. And your blackberries are coming in when you said? We don't know what day. Um, typically, it's Thursday. It might be Friday. Wait past Thursday, Friday next week. Right. They told us late next week they'll arrive, so. Thank you. That's very helpful. Thank you.